So I've said Acts chapter 16 like three times. Now we've got it on video, so it's official. So Acts chapter 16 is where we're going to be this morning. And uh, Kai, if you could do the KJV just for a little bit. Normally I use the NIV, but there's one particular phrase that I want out of the King James Version. You know, one of the challenging things about being a pastor in a worship service. Well, before I say that, let me say this. So you see what we've done this morning is we put another building block on the foundation of the church. And, and what I hope you're going to see even more and more as we go through this over the next couple of weeks is that from these building blocks, things are growing out. So what we found out last week in Acts chapter 2 in verse 43, I think, when the church continued together steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and the breaking of bread and fellowship and prayer, that the, and then we see them in the temple courts praising God, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So as we build the foundation the way it ought to be built, what we see growing out of that foundation is what I'm going to call, I mean, I don't know what to call it yet. We see fruit being born in the church and in the kingdom of God because the church is being the church. And it's not like, you know, it's not like Andrew said, hey, Simon and, 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 and James and John, I've got a great evangelism program for fishermen. I've got this, let's put it into action and we can get all these fishermen coming to the church. They didn't do anything like that. They just did these basic things and the church began to grow and the Lord added to their number, number daily those who were being saved. So this morning, we're going to add the, 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 the building block of praise and worship. And so what I just said is that in Acts chapter 2, when we ended that chapter, what we saw is that daily in the temple courts, the people were praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. So very early on, we see the, the early church committed to praising God as a regular part of what they did, not only when they came together, but when they were out in their individual locations. So even when they come together, you've got corporate praise. Now, their corporate worship went on most generally in the early chapters of Acts in the temple. We know that in Acts chapter 5, I believe, Peter and John are on their way to the temple because it, because it is the hour of prayer. So they're going to the temple to, to, to do their prayer. That's where they did their praise. That's where they did some of their teaching. All of those things were going on in a corporate environment in the temple. Now, hard for us to fully understand that, but, but, but that's what they did. And as I said a couple weeks ago on Wednesday, to make the comparison that the temple is like, is like this building is not really a fair comparison. We're more like a synagogue than we are the temple. But they went to the temple. Now, if you think about the way the temple was set up, it, it was set up in such a way that made it kind of hard for everyone in the church to kind of be together. And so we know they were at the temple. As a matter of fact, we know from later on in the book of Acts, they actually met together in a place called Solomon's Colonnade or Solomon's Porch. And that's where they got together. That was actually in what's called the Court of the Women, I believe. So in the temple, this is the way it was set up. So in the very center of the temple, you have what we call the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. And from there, everything kind of radiated out. See, it's in the holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's, that's, that's the place where uh, God's presence dwelt. And beyond that, you had the holy place. Beyond that, I believe you had the court of the priests. So the priests and the Levites were the people who were allowed to get as close as really you could as a group. And then in the holy place, the priests were allowed in there. And in the Holy of Holies, only the high priest was allowed in there one time a year. So you had the court of the priests. Beyond that, you had the court of Israel, where the general Israelite population could come if you're male. So women weren't allowed in the court of Israel. They had their own court called, guess what it was called? The court of the women. How easy is that? And so you had the court of the women... And then beyond that, you had what's called the court of the Gentiles. And in the court of the Gentiles, or in the court of the women, is where we find this place called Solomon's Porch or Solomon's Colonnade. So the early church came together in a place where most everybody was going to be allowed to get together. But if you think about how temple worship set up, like you got the, the high priest is in point A, the regular priests are in point B, uh, the common population is in point C, the women are in point D, and the Gentiles are in point, comes after D, E. So doesn't that seem a little bit exclusionary? It does to me. I mean, it almost seems like, and it conveys the idea that the holier you are, unfortunately, ladies, you're on the outer, outer bands of this, but the holier you are, the closer you get to be to God. So if you're one of the select few 
who were born into the right family, man, you could be in the you could be in the court of the priests. But if you had the unfortunate situation of being born a Gentile, then you're going to be all the way outside in the court of the Gentiles. And that seems to be the way it was set up. And so what we see very early on in the Old Testament in particular is a form in worship. I'm going to call it a system or a structure or something like that. What we see in the Old Testament is this worship being very structured, being very uh, functional. It was done a certain way. Look, there were certain physical uh, diseases that would exclude you from the temple. There were certain physical deformities that maybe someone was born with, or maybe they had an accident and were maimed. They were not permitted into any court in the temple. They just had to sit outside. That's why you've got in Acts chapter 5, that's why you've got a lame man who's kind of sitting outside the court begging for money because he wasn't even allowed in there. So you've got this whole form set up that seems on the surface very exclusionary and very difficult to break into where God is. You also, in the book of Revelation, see, because we don't get that. Matter of fact, in our culture today, the whole idea that, that worship or a worship service would be structured and defined down to what we do and when we do it, tough for us to get, isn't it? I mean, especially here in Buchanan, in these country churches, uh, that's just, we're not into that. We like a little bit of freedom when we worship. But what we see in the Old Testament is a very defined system of worship. And when you get into the book of Revelations, you know what you see once again? So for everybody that like doesn't like form and function and worship, you're going to freak out when you get in the book of Revelations. Because you know what you see there? You see a lot of form going on. Or at least I do when I look at it. I mean, imagine if you're in heaven and all of a sudden 4 and 20 elders all fall down at the same time. Imagine getting into heaven and all you hear is, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You're like, well, that, that's going to get boring after a few thousand years, right? But that's what it seems like is going on in the book of Revelation, where we've got this very structured idea of what worship is. And the challenge for every pastor is, how do I how do we balance together the idea that I can come to church and do and say whatever I want, which is really based more on American liberty than in the scripture. You know that, right? Versus the idea that when I come to church, there's going to be a system in which I have to function if I really want to worship. How do you balance that all together? And, and most of us in America, we like this free style of worship, don't we? I mean, we like coming and being able to testify. Just stand up and testify. I've been in churches where you don't just stand up and testify. If you want to testify, you meet with the deacons, and the deacons will listen to your testimony, and they'll say, okay, uh, two weeks from now you can testify. That's just the way it's done. So, so we've kind of come to enjoy this idea that I just kind of stand up and if I want to sing a song, I sing a song. If I want to testify, I testify. If I want to read a scripture, I want to read a scripture. So how do you balance that all together? So worship becomes what it should be, which is genuine. The genuine worship of Jehovah is what we strive for. And that can be challenging because in American culture, what we want is an experience that's going to make us feel good about ourselves. We want to come to church and we want to be moved in some way. Usually we want to be moved emotionally. So if we cry a little bit or we shout a little bit or we raise our hands, or then we're going to like, wow, it's an awesome worship service. If it's really emotional, that's kind of the way we think. And so sometimes we got to try to balance the way we do that because we want freedom in worship. We want a little bit of form in worship. That's kind of the way worship is set up. What we know, so what we know is that when it comes to worship in the New Testament, it's different than what it ever have, has been. And the reason we know that is because Jesus says to a Samaritan woman, as he's meeting with her at a well, the question she has in her mind is, well, where do we worship at? Because you Jews say we need to worship in Jerusalem, but our ancestors say that we worship in this mountain. So, so where do we, and Jesus says, lady, there's a time coming when neither in this place or in Jerusalem you're going to worship because the true worshipers of God Worship in spirit and in truth. So how do we balance together this idea of worship where we do it both with freedom and with structure, with flexibility and, 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 and with a little bit of, I hate to use the word legalism, Does that, will that freak everybody out if I say that? I don't mean to, but there's got to be a little bit of structure. So, so how do we balance between uh, how do we balance between the supernatural moving of God and the structure that needs to exist in worship? And that is the challenge as we look at worship, praise and worship as a building block of the church. So let me read the scripture here, and then we're going to pray. So we're going to start in verse uh, 25, Kai, if you will. Yep, I think he's already got it. I think we'll be in verse 25. So at midnight, 
Paul and Silas were praying and singing praises to God. Now, this is why I use the King James Version, because I wanted this phrase, sang praises, to be clear. NIV doesn't say it that way. It says sing hymns. But obviously, we've got the word praise on the building block, so we got to put praise up on here, right? Or it's not going to make sense. So at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard that. Now keep in mind, we got these prisoners that are listening to what Paul and Silas were doing. And so then, as they were singing and praising God, suddenly the Bible says, um, about midnight, I believe it was, Oh, yeah, it was about midnight in the previous verse. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison uh, were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds fell off. Now you realize what's going to happen at that point, right? I mean, everybody knows the inevitable conclusion of what's going to happen. And so the keeper of the jailer, the jailer comes rushing in when he realizes what's going on. So the keeper of the jail comes in and... And uh, he, he, was, he woke out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, uh, he thought everyone had escaped. So he drew out his sword and he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul then cries out and says, do yourself no harm, for we, all, we are all here. Now, that's all he says. Don't, don't kill yourself. Everyone's here. And so he called for a light. And then he says, like the King James, he called for a light and he sprang in. Did you see him doing that? See, I was going to spring in with this real videotape. I don't want this to ever be online anywhere where someone can use it against me. So he called for a light, and he sprang in, and he came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. And look at the question that he asks. Next verse. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? All because they were praising God. So you see how evangelism grows out of the foundation of the church, not through any great strategy we come up with. Bow your heads with me. Father, we want to pause this morning to thank you for your word and for the truth and power that is contained in your word. Ultimately, what you have to say to us is more important than anything else. It's more important than any commentary that I can add or any notes that I've written down. Your word is sharp and powerful. Your word has the ability to penetrate our souls, dividing soul from spirit, and really doing in us what we cannot do for ourselves. It has the ability to recreate us into your image and make us like your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, that's what we want this morning, is to be a reflection of your son, Jesus. Let your word have its way in our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we've got this situation where Paul and Silas are in prison. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, this is not your traditional time and place for corporate worship. Would you agree with that? No one wants to have praise and worship from a Philippian jail. Except for apparently Paul and Silas. They seem to be very, be very good at going to jail and then when they're in jail, having some radical thing take place around them. I, I think it's because they understood that it didn't matter where they were at or what was going on. God was working through them and God was going to do what he wanted to do. So Paul seemed, Paul seemed to get that very well. And, and I said earlier, you know, we want a worship experience where we feel a certain way. See, in American culture, we want to do worship like we would eat at a buffet. Give me a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, I, want, I don't want any of that, but I want some of this. And I'm going to put on my plate what, what makes me feel the best about my experience. And the reality is, we don't need an experience when we come to worship. We need to have an encounter with the living God. We don't need an experience where we feel better. We need an encounter where our lives are being transformed. That's ultimately what worship should do. It should bring us into the presence of God in a way that I can look at God and realize who I am and who He is. And when I do that, suddenly perspective begins to change for me as I recognize my utter inability to please God and never serve Him in any way by my own power. So we need an encounter, and I think that's important. You know, worship should create a way in which I can get close to God. It should not just make me feel good. Although, look... Should worship, should you enjoy coming to worship? I believe you should. Should you should you leave worship and say, man, it's a powerful worship service? Yes, I believe you absolutely should. But we can't let emotion dictate the reality of the worship service. It's got to be intimacy that is created by me and me alone in the presence of God. And if I'm not intimate with God when I worship here, then I'm probably not going to enjoy intimacy with God anywhere. You see, the reason Paul and Silas could be in a Philippian jail 
and have and have a worship service that is so profound it leads to a jailer being transformed is because they were a place where intimacy with God was just created all around them. And so we want we, we need an encounter. We don't need an experience. We need an encounter with the living God. And so uh, but does anybody remember a couple years ago? I don't even know. Bobby, you remember a couple years ago doing some teaching on worship? That was a long time ago. Does anybody remember Bobby's Wednesday night? It was a Wednesday night lesson. And I remember Bobby teaching on worship. And one of the things that stood out to me, and I never thought about it this way, I mean, worship's just worship, right? How many words do we have for worship in English? One, worship. I mean, I guess we could stretch other things into it. But really, when we talk about worship, we know what we mean. And, and in Hebrew, there are multiple words for worship. I think there were three, if I remember right. In Greek, there are multiple words for worship. And I believe there are four. So in the Bible, we've got at least seven different words that are used for worship in the Bible. Now, when we go to the Old Testament and we see the structure that is so common, those words mean stuff like to bow down or to serve. Generally, they talk as much about posture as they do anything. So worship in the Old Testament would be about, you know, I, I bow down. Or, you know, one of the words is just to lay flat face down. So, so that's kind of the idea that is conveyed by worship in the Old Testament. It's kind of structured, it's kind of rigorous, but that's the idea. And, and those different words all convey that idea. So um, it, we want to move to a point where we get beyond posture. Because it's not that I don't think posture is important. But see, in the New Testament, if God is bringing to completion everything that was in the Old Testament... If in the Old Testament we're looking at physical posture, you know what we're looking at in the New Testament? We're looking at spiritual posture, not physical posture. So you can come in and you can stand and praise God with as much sincerity as what you can on your knees begging God. So physical posture is not as important as spiritual posture. And that's where intimacy comes in. Because I want to be in a place where I can come before God um, and I can just fall down before Him spiritually and lay in his presence. That's what we're looking for in worship. That's what we strive to do in worship. And so we need to be careful that we understand that because we don't want to leave a Sunday morning and say, well, you know, uh, man, it was a good service. You know, Rob just got the spirit and ran around the church. I mean, you remember those services, right? Or, you know, when somebody lets out a whale, not a, not a fish, but you know what I mean, because I'm from Pike County, so people are going to hear that saying, well, they got a whale in their church? No, a whale is that loud, woo, you know, they used to hear in church, especially during the Bible. And so, you know, if we start measuring the effectiveness of a worship service by how much physical manifestation there was, then we're really missing the true spiritual aspect. And that's what's important in the New Testament, because Jesus came to bring to completion everything in the Old Testament. And so what we know... So if you think again about the temple, the Holy of Holies was in the middle of the temple. That's where everybody wanted to be, but not everybody's going to get there except for one guy once a year. So we know that when Jesus died, when Jesus is dying on Calvary, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place, that veil was torn in two from top to bottom, signifying that through Jesus now, any barriers to the presence of God have been taken out of the way. And the Gentiles who are in the outer court, you know what they get to do? They get to be in the Holy of Holies in a real and spiritual way. The women who've been in the court of the women, alienated from the men of Israel, the women now spiritually can be in the presence of God in a real way. Because Jesus took down all the barriers that brought separation. So what that means is that worship now is different than it's ever been before. Worship is going to take on a spiritual side that you do not pick up on in the Old Testament if you're not reading very carefully. It's there. We just don't see it because we get wrapped up in the, hey, bring your oil, and the priest is going to pour some of it out, and then take your grain and wave it, and then when you bring your calf, we're going to put the kidneys here and the liver here, we're going to divide it all up, we read that we're like, that's just gross. I don't want anything to do with that. But that's why they had to do it. Well, we're not doing anything differently in the New Testament except that the sacrifice that has been offered is Jesus. 
And we enter the presence of God through his living sacrifice. And so we worship God in spirit and truth, or, or, or we, should, we should worship God in spirit and truth. So let's go back to verse 26, Kai, if you would. So what we know is that Paul and Silas, about midnight, are, 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 are praying and they're singing praises to God. Okay? And so suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds fell off. Okay, so think about that. 21st century America. Southern Ohio Correctional Facility is what, 25 minutes from here maybe? Imagine if at this moment an earthquake hit Scioto County. The building is shaken and all the doors, all the, the bars are, they're just opened up and everybody's chains. And we don't chain people, but, but you get the idea, right? All the doors are open. Everybody's free to go. I guarantee you, within minutes, every one of our iPhones would be broadcasting the emergency alert tone, wouldn't they? Saying there's been a jailbreak. Prisoners are on the loose. Because really, do, do any of you have any expectation that if someone went to RCI or SOCF and opened it up, that prisoners would not escape? Of course they would. Been trying to do that. Look, prisoners have been trying to escape from the very first prison, I would wager. And so what we know is that if that happened today, there would be lockdowns. You think COVID lockdown is bad? We'd be locked down in a way that we couldn't move till everyone was rounded up. I mean, isn't that what would happen? So imagine how odd it is then that when this earthquake hits and the prisoners' doors are open and their bonds are loosed, no one runs away. Let me tell you, that is a supernatural movement of God because prisoners don't instinctively want to stay in jail. I, I think I've never been a prisoner, but I would think if I was a prisoner, I would want to get out of jail more than anything else. And I probably wouldn't care how I went about doing it. Much, you know, you always watch the old westerns. They bake you a loaf of bread or a pie, you know, and they smuggle in. A what? Dynamite. I was thinking a saw or a file. That's what I was thinking. But, but I want to break out of jail with Higgins, right? Because it's going to involve explosives, which is more effective. I, I was actually thinking a file. So, you know, Jeannie's, Jeannie's thinking a saw, which makes more sense, because I'm going to be filing on my bars for about 45 years, which probably means my sentence is over. Uh, Jeannie's going to be sawing through hers a little bit quicker than I am. But Mitch is getting out the same day. And he's probably taking a guard with him more than likely. So, so th that's what I'd be thinking of. I mean, you know, I want to get out in jail. I want to get out of jail. I I'm in prison, but I don't want to be in prison. I want to be a free man. So when the opportunity comes, I'm out the door, but not here. Doesn't it strike you as strange that when the prison doors swing open and the chains fall off, all the prisoners are so enthralled by what Paul and Silas are doing that no one moves. Everyone just stays there. Now, the keeper of the jail comes, he knows what's going on. And I'm guessing, and I don't know this, I'm just kind of guessing he's probably a Roman centurion, maybe not a centurion. Not, no, he wouldn't be a centurion. He may have been, I don't know. I'm guessing he's Roman army. And the reason I say that is because, you know, Philippi was a provincial city. And so he had a Roman garrison. Matter of fact, the city of Philippi was actually commanded by two Roman officers. So that's who ran the city. So I'm guessing they had a large Roman military presence. I'm guessing that this jailer is a Roman military man. If not, he understands the rules. So back in this day and age, if you're the jailer and prisoner escapes, guess what happens? They kill you. That's just the rule. I don't know who made the rule. I'm just telling you, that was the rule. So the jailer now, when he realizes what's happened, foundations shaken, doors are open, chains have fallen off. When he realized what's happened, he pulls out his sword and he's ready to kill himself. And you're like, well, that's crazy. Why would he do that? Let me just tell you, in this day and age, that is preferable to what the Romans are going to do to you. You take your sword and fall on it. That's the easy way out. So this guy gets his sword. And when he sees the doors are open, he would have killed himself because he assumed, logically, that everyone ran away. But Paul... Knowing what's going on, calls out to the jailer and says, hey, 
Don't do yourself any harm. We are all here. Now that makes no logical sense. Nothing about this series of events makes any logical sense. Never in any real world scenario does it ever play out like this. But it does now. Because what we see is the supernatural moving of God on people's lives and they are captivated by what he's doing. That's the only way to describe it. There's no logical reason why prisoners don't run away unless they're hearing and seeing something that is supernatural in its design. All because Paul and Silas are praying and singing praise. They're worshiping God. And everybody's like, I don't know what these guys are into. I can't leave. I can't look away. I gotta, gotta hear what's coming next. I gotta see what's going on. So much so that when they have a chance to run, they do not run. And the jailer, when he hears Paul's words, when he hears Paul say, Don't do yourself any harm, we're all here. His very first statement is not, Woo! That's what I would have said. Woo! Dodge the bullet there. You wouldn't dodge a bullet. Dodge the sword there. That's not what he says. His immediate response, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now think about that. There's been no evangelism plan. Paul and Silas didn't get together and say, Hey, you know what? These guys are ready for the four spiritual laws. I think they're right. Let's go ahead and go through the process. No one said that. It's not like Silas said, Hey, Paul, you got that Roman road stuff done yet? Because we can use that right now. We're going we're gonna to evangelize this whole... Nobody had that. They're simply doing what the church does when it comes together, irregardless of where it's at. It can be in a jail cell. It can be in a church building like this. It can be at work. It can be at home. It can be anywhere in your community. When the church of God comes together and does what the church of God is supposed to do, God works in an incredible and powerful and a supernatural way that defies understanding and expectation. So I hope you see now that when the church is built on the right foundation, what grows out of that, in this case, is going to be evangelism. So for two weeks in a row now, we see the church doing what we would consider basic church stuff. They're praying, they're listening to teaching, they're breaking bread, and they're fellowshipping, they're praising God, and when they do that, you know what God does? God grows the church out of that. See, as we talk about the foundation of the church, we're eventually going to get this built. Okay, so this is going to be finished at some point. Okay? And so, so some, have you looked at this like, Danny's putting those things on wrong because the blank spot is not covered up with the right plaque. Did you all think that? Because there's like stuff in here like, why, why, are those, why are those empty spots there? Shouldn't the plaques be there? No, they shouldn't. There's a purpose for that, isn't there, Danny? There is. And there's a purpose. So if you want to find out what that purpose is, you've got to stick it out through the whole thing. But then... Once this is done, what we're going to find out is this, this foundation supports pillars in the church upon which the activities of the church grow out of. I mean, I don't know much about a pillar. I think pillar may be a good idea, just for the record. Uh, so I don't know much about pillars, but I do know that they're round, or sometimes they're kind of scalloped a little bit. Is that the right word? They're kind of in concave. Nobody ever seen one of these Corinthian or Roman pillars? So they're, they're round, they're kind of concave in places. They are made of, I don't know, marble, granite, something heavy, right? So if you take a pillar and you just set it on the ground, you put a bunch of weight on it, what's going to happen? Okay, let's say you build a pole barn. Hey, you know all about that, right? We build a pole barn. So you take, let's say you're building a, a pole barn and you've got four quarter poles. And you just take them out and set them on the ground and start nailing boards to it. Then you put the sides on. Then you put the roof on. What's going to happen to your pole barn? Look, we live in Pike County. Everybody, this is like Pike County 101. Everybody understands pole barns. What's going to happen is your pole barn is going to sink down in the ground, right? So all of a sudden, your 10-foot pole barn that you built is now a 7-foot high pole barn because you had no foundation and, and, and the structure sank into the ground. But we're building on a foundation so that as we set these pillars, more I think about it, more I like pillars, just so you understand that, right? Yeah. So, so as we set these pillars upon the church or the foundation, they are, they have solidarity. And the foundation is not going to give way. 
Okay? And praise and worship is one of the things the church does that is foundational to being in church. Now, there are other ones. And look, let me just tell you, there are other ones that we are not going to get through in the course of this. But we picked out what I believe are the most important ones. And the one this morning is worship. And I can't tell you how critical worship is when we come together as believers. You're like, well, Brian, we get that. I mean, we do it every Sunday. Come on, we get that. Yeah, we get it to the extent that we leave saying good service, mm, okay service. Because we would never say bad service, right? I mean, that would just be hypocritical. That would be hypocritical. That would be like, uh, what's the word? Like, Harris, blasphemy. Yeah, be blasphemy. So we say great service, we say good service, we'll say it's okay. We never say bad service because that would be wrong. So we need to get beyond that mentality that says, well, I need to think of worship as something I engage every week based on my personal preference of style. It cannot work that way. So that's why we talk about this foundation of worship because worship becomes critical to what we do. And I know you get that. Look, I think we get worship better than we do fellowship. I mean... Unfortunately, we've learned how to spend a year really without fellowship as a church. And I'm telling you, I said when I started this, that bothers me more than anything else this last year. Because fellowship, there's a reason fellowship is like close to the bottom. Because that is so crucial to what we do. Worship is like that. We have, you know, we have this, this misunderstanding of what worship should be and how it should work. So it, it become, worship becomes about kind of catering to my personal style and needs. And if you do that, great job. If you don't, maybe next week. We need to move beyond that. So when it comes to that, you know, how we think about balance and, and how we balance all of that stuff, you know, how does that look? Because that's really what we want to get at. Now, in the New Testament, um, the word that is most often translated as worship, and, and there are four Greek words for worship in the New Testament. The word that is most often translated is uh, pro, uh, pros. Pros Kanoa, and it means to bow, to show, to do homage, or to kiss the hand. Now, you, you get that, right? It's like kiss the ring or kiss the hand, because that's what you do when you meet the Pope, I think. You kiss his hand or you kiss his ring. One of my Bible dictionaries actually said this, and I couldn't believe it. So, so the, one, the word means to, like, to show homage is when you kiss someone's hand. Um, one of my Bible dictionaries said to kiss the hand um, like a dog licking its master's hand. Now think about that for just a minute. If you have a dog, we have a dog. I don't like the dog. For some reason, the dog really likes me. And I've never liked the dog. The dog, when I come home, you know who the first person to greet me at that door is? Rhonda. No, it's a dog. It's a dog. I come home, dog comes running to the door, wagging its tail. And when I bend down on top of my shoes, you know what the stupid dog wants to do? It wants to lick my hand. I'm like, snap. I don't want my hand licked. My, my hands are clean. Get off of me, you dirty mongrel. So the dog wants to lick my hand. And so then, when I go sit down on the couch, dog jumps up on the couch, stands right on my lap. You know what it wants to do? It wants to lick my hand or my face or anything. Get a hold of And so then when I sit down at the table and eat, you know what the dog does? Stupid dog. It's a wiener dog. Sets up like a prairie dog. In my house. You come to my house and eat. Somewhere around the table, you got a dog sitting up like this. Just looking. And if you accidentally lower your hand to your lap, you know what's going to happen? Stupid dogs are going to be licking your hand. Why does it do? It makes no sense to me. Other than what I know this, is that when, when I come home and the dog wants to lick my hand, which is just gross anyway. You know that, right? Dogs are gross. But you know what? You know why the dogs, do you know why dog does that? Sign of affection? Yeah. You know what else it is? <laughs> yeah, but I had Wendy's on my way home. No, no. It's a sign of affection. <laughs> now, I'd be licking my shirt probably if I had Wendy's on the way home. It's not just, it's a sign of affection. You, you know what it is? It is, a, it is a show of homage or humility to me because the dog, as a wiener dog, recognizes Brian could like throw me out of the house if he wants to. Brian could like step on me and break my back. Brian could do any number of things that he's thought about over the years that he won't even say publicly because it's kind of weird. He could do any of that, but he doesn't. He allows me to live. He allows me to eat. He gives me everything that I've got. And so the dog does that because he shows homage. Now, I know that's weird, but, but that's what one of my Bible dictionaries said. The word to kiss the hand, that's what it means. I'm going to bow down. I'm going to kiss your hand, and I'm going to show you the respect that you deserve because, and you know why we do that? So this is why we worship. We come together to worship. We do that to God. We fall down before him, 
and, and we don't, you know, we think, oh, I'm going to kiss his hand. No, for me, I'm more like I'm more like the sinful woman that comes in with a box of uh, a, a, an alabaster box. Or no, 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 no. I'm like the sinful woman that has long hair. Okay, that's the one I'm like. I'm like the sinful woman that has long hair that doesn't have any ointment. So I want to anoint his feet with my tears, and then I want to dry it with the hairs of my head. That is an act of reverence. That just blew everybody away when she did that. And and, and the host. Sitting there watching what's going on. And he, he, he thought to himself, you know what? If this guy was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. He didn't know what kind of woman it was. And when she poured out her sacrifice, because that's what she did. She didn't, did she have anything? I mean, she probably didn't have any money. She, she didn't have anything to bring. What she brought is really key to genuine and authentic worship. And that's what we want to get to. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. So if, if we want to have an encounter with God, because that's what worship should be. If we want to have an encounter with God, low power, time is, I don't care about low power. Okay, if we want to have an encounter with God, this is the way it's going to have to happen. When we come together, okay, individually, we're going to have to deal with the issue of confession and repentance. Now, I know that freaks us out as Protestants because like, hey, don't, don't tell me about that. I took care of all that. You need to hound me when I come to church and I need to be repentant. I need to confess my sin. Well, look, I don't know if you picked up on this in the New Testament. But there are multiple passages in the New Testament where we're told to confess our sin. You know that, right? It's not something that we leave buried. I think that in the American church, we are, we are really content uh, with not dealing with the issue of sin in our lives. Because we think, oh, God's got it. I don't need to worry about that. I mean, God, God already knows that. This is what we say. Oh, God knows my heart. I don't have to worry about that. He just takes care of it automatically because he's God, right? No. There's a reason we confess our sin. There's a reason we come to God in repentance. It's almost like in the American church, we're more afraid of being repentant than we are of being sinful. I believe that we'd rather come to church and say, oh, I'm just a wicked sinner, can't do anything about it, than we would come to church, stand at a distance like a publican, and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We're more like the Pharisee that wants to get close and say, hey, I tithe this week. I came to every service. I'm doing my part, God. I, you know, I'm glad I'm like that dude standing out there beating his chest. He's a wicked sinner. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but man, that dude's really messed up. No, we need to come to worship like, like a publican who beats his chest and says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus says, you, you know which one went to their house justified, right? It was not the Pharisee, it was the publican. So in 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 16, I think, but you don't have to look it up, God. It's chapter 12, maybe. So in 2 Samuel, chapter 12, uh, David is confronted by Nathan the prophet. And you all remember what he's confronted about? Yep. David... Had been uh, David had strayed a little bit in his relationship with his first two wives. <laughs> it sounds weird to say that. I, mean, I didn't do that, but, but he did. I think it was two, maybe it's three, I don't know. But he strayed a little bit, and, and he found this other woman that he really was into. Probably because she was taking a bath on the roof of her house, and he saw her. He's like, hey, get that. who is that? That's Bathsheba, that's Uriah's wife. Yeah, send her my way. So you don't know what happened, right, with, with David and Bathsheba. And so, you know, he, he, Bathsheba finds out that she's pregnant and she sends word to David. So what's David do? David uh, calls her husband Uriah, who, by the way, Uriah is an awesome guy, loyal to David. In a way, David doesn't even get. I mean, you know, Uriah, Uriah comes home and he says, hey, you need some R&R. &R. Go, go spend the night at your house. You know, see your wife. Uriah says, uh-huh. I'm sleeping outside your door. I am not going to come home when the army's out of battle. And so David realizes, great, I'm not getting out of this. So, so he writes a letter to uh, Joab, his commander, and he says, hey, you know, what I want you to do is I, I want you to set your riot in the hottest part of the battle. And when the battle kind of reaches its in this fevered pitch, I want you all to pull back and leave your riot to die. And he sends it with your riot to deliver. And so your riot is killed. Once Uriah is dead, we're all good, right? I mean, there's, there's, no one knows what's going on. It's David and Bathsheba and a few servants. And you think the servants are going to say anything? Not if you want to end up like Uriah or not. Okay, So nobody's going to say anything. 
whole deal's been swept under the rug and everybody's good. That is until the day Nathan comes into David's, David's uh, house, throne room, I don't know what it was, where, where David was. Nathan shows up and he tells his story. He's like, hey, there was this rich man who had a bunch of goats or sheep or something like that. And there's this poor guy who had one little ewe lamb and he loved it more than anything else. And it ate from his table, kind of like my stupid dog. And it slept in his bed. And, and he, it was like family more than it was an animal. And so this rich man comes to town and he says to this poor man with one ewe lamb, hey, give me your lamb, we're going to eat it. David says, are you kidding me? That's going on in my kingdom? I will put up with that. Do you remember what he said? The man who did this will surely what? Oh, you're cheating. Right, good job. The man who did this must surely die. So David, man, he's enraged. Nathan looks at David and he says, David, you are the man. You did it. It's not about this lamb. It's about what you did to Uriah. And so David, man, he is confronted with his sin in a real way. And Nathan says, because you've done this, because you've given an occasion for the enemies of the Lord to mock me, the child that Bathsheba is bearing is going to die. So you know what David does? I mean, David does what probably any dad would do. He, uh, he, he, he puts on sackcloth and he, he fasts for seven days. No food. Matter of fact, his servants are bringing him food and he won't eat and they're worried about it. So for seven days, he fasts and he doesn't eat and he pleads. Does he plead? He, David pleaded with God for the child. So he pleads, God, God save, my, save my son or daughter or whatever it is. Save my baby. Don't want it to die. And so seven days, no food, no, probably not much water, laying in sackcloth, begging God. Then seven days later, he sees his servants kind of talking off to the side. And you know, they're talking about the fact that the baby has now died. And so David, David, he, he kind of sees him, he hears him, they're whispering among themselves, and no one wants to tell David because, look, I'm just telling you, sometimes if you give David bad news, he kills you. So you want to be careful about that. So they're like, ah, you know, what do we do? Baby's dead, we've got to tell him. And so David sees it, and he says, is the child dead? And uh, they say, yes, the child is dead. Now, Kai, go to the next verse, I think. So what does David immediately do? What does he immediately do when, he, when the baby dies? It says that David got up from the ground after he had washed and put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and what? Worshipped. He went into worship. But don't think that David went into the house of, uh, of the Lord and worshipped. And, and then he went to eat after that. So you know what his priority was? i got to get in the presence of God. I'm a sinner. And so David actually writes this. Do you know David wrote a song about this? It's called Psalm 51. And this is part of what he says in Psalm 51. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Now he's writing that in the context of a dead son and being confronted about his sin. So he says, open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. See, David got the attitude that you bring to worship. And it's one of repentance. Was David repentant? Yeah, see, see that's what separates David from what I see in American culture. We engage in sin, and we're like, oh, I'm just good with that. God's good with that. God made me. There's no way God made me this way. I'm going to go out and I'm going to willfully sin and I'm going to say, oops, God made me that way. I'm going to go out and live disobediently. I'm going to live immorally. I'm going to live the way I want to live. It's not my fault. God, it's your fault because you made me this way. No, you are defective because of sin that is in your life. The solution is not to say, oh, no big deal. The solution is to say, Lord, God, have mercy on me according to your loving kindness. Against you and you alone have I sinned and committed this iniquity. Wash me with his own. Purge me and I'll be whiter than snow. That's the attitude that we bring to worship. See, that's why when you read, I read like three verses of Psalm 51, but the way it begins is, that's exactly the way it begins. Have mercy on me according to your loving kindness. And it's a song that basically says, yeah, I messed up, God. I, I, I messed up and I blew it. But I'm begging you 
to forgive me. Repentance and confession are absolutely crucial to real worship when we come together. I mean, if we want to get into the presence of God, you realize, so we, we learned this from like our earliest age. Sin alienates us from God. You know that, right? So why is it that we who've been saved from sin, how is it that those of us that understand the Romans road, how is it those of us that understand the four, four spiritual laws where we know that sin is the dividing barrier between us and God? How is it that we can live in sin and believe that we still have intimacy with God? We can't. But yet we believe that because culturally we've been taught to believe that. We've so watered down the message of the gospel so that it says now, well, you, you can go ahead and continue in sin. You know what Paul says when, when he asks this rhetorical question? How can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? We've died to sin. No, that doesn't mean we're perfect now. But when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. When we sin, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, so when we come to worship, if repentance isn't the first thing on our mind, then we're not going to come and be able to worship the way we should. And so we're going to leave thinking, that was okay. Worship team could have done better. Brian could have had a better sermon. That's, that's what's going to happen if we're not coming with an attitude of repentance. So we've got, we've got this element, I'm going to call it an element of worship that we call confession and repentance. That's like elements, but I'm putting them together as one. Uh, how about we call it confession? Uh, confessions? Can I do that? It's confessions and repentance all rolled into one. So when I come to worship, I've confessed any sin and I've repented of any sin. So when I'm coming in, I'm ready to get close to Jesus and be at his feet crying my eyes out spiritually and washing his feet with my hair. That's what I'm doing because I've got that much intimacy in my life. Now, obviously, praise would be important, right? So Paul and Silas at midnight are singing praises. In Acts 2.47, every day in the temple court, you know what the early church is doing? They're praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. We see praise consistently practiced in the early church. And, and look, praise should be a part of what we do. Uh, in, in Acts 16, when, when Luke wrote, uh, about midnight, they're, pray, they're praying and singing praise. That word for praise is uh, humnos in Greek. We would get our word hymn from that. So they're basically singing a song. That's what they're doing. But it's not just a song. I mean, it's not like we show up on Sunday morning and find some pseudo-spiritual song that we can make you know, Christian, that's not what we do. It's not like, you know, we walked in this morning, Mitch is playing Renegade by Sticks. Is that who did Renegade? Mitch, ah, look, that's got a rocking tune. It would be fun to listen to, but that's not the same thing, right? That's not a who knows. That's not a hymn. We come together and we specifically sing. Y'all know Renegade back there in the young people? You know, you know Renegade by Sticks? No, they're just saying that. Not one of them knows who Sticks is. And if they do, it's Mr. Roboto. Right? Not, not the good stuff. It's the 80s pop synth stuff. So, so we, we, we come in and we sing these songs that are different than any other songs. I mean, if you come to church, you realize it pretty quickly. Well, their the music's a little different. Their music's a little weird. I, I don't really, I don't, I don't hear that anywhere. Because you know, if you don't listen to Kayla or the river, you, you miss out on all this stuff. But when we come together, we have this particular style of worship. We come together, we do that because we want to give praise to God. And so praise has to be a part of what we do. Now, you know, I guess the question always becomes is, well, you know, what, what is praise? I mean, how far does praise go? What is praise? Does that mean I have to testify? Does that mean I have to sing if I don't like to sing? Does that mean I have to read a screen? Does that mean I have to do what I see other people doing? And the answer to that is, no, it, it's not. Praise can be silent. It doesn't have to be loud. Uh, it can be loud, and it can be very vocal, but it can be silent, and it can be personal, and it can be private. That's the beauty of the way worship works. So when we come together, we praise God, or we give praise to God. Uh, Hebrews 13, 15 says, you just texted me. Through Jesus, th through, uh, therefore, G see, I'm all messed up now. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly 
profess his name. Now, my Bible had a footnote in it. And this is my NIV Bible. Had a footnote that referred me to Psalm 118, uh, 6 and 7. Now, I looked at that and I saw no connection between those verses at all. But what I thought when I read it is, man, that sounds like a psalm to me. I mean, it sounds like what he's saying there when he says, Through Jesus let us therefore continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Then I thought, well, hold on. I think there's a Bible verse that says we bring the sacrifice of praise. I don't think there is, though. I think it's a song by Maranatha. But maybe there is. Hold on. Don't worry, Danny. We're getting close. So I found... Psalm 50.23 that says, The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. So the one who shows up and says, Thank you for what you've done for me. That is his sacrifice. That's the gift that he brings. Yes, there it is. Those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me and the blameless I will show my salvation. So, we get the concept of we bring a sacrifice of praise because it was a song that we probably, I don't know if we sang it here, we sang it here, we sang it here over the years. So we get that. When we come, we bring this sacrifice of praise. So praise is an integral, a critical element of worship. So when we come together, we want to make sure there is confession and repentance. We want to make sure that we bring an attitude of praise into everything that we do. Can be vocal, cannot be vocal. It can be silent tears, can be no tears, can be wh whatever God is doing in your life. However you express that, that's what it is. That's the beauty of it. Not everybody does it the same, and we don't have to do it the same. But we do all have to bring a sacrifice. And that leads me to the third element we're going to talk about, and that is an offering. Okay? When I was growing up, I always loved to hear this. So when I was growing up, we take up the uh, offering. Some, someone, whoever was like leading the service, and say, okay, it's time to worship the Lord in our what? In our tithes and offerings. See, Danny gets that. Did you ever hear that growing up? I know Bill did. So it's time to worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings. And look, I'm okay with that. Just so you know. Because, look, we give out of a grateful heart. I mean, we don't give because we feel obligated to give. Maybe some people do, but if you can, and I don't want you ever giving because you feel obligated to give. I want you to give because God moves you to give. Okay? So somebody would say, well, let's worship the Lord in our tithes and offering. And then everybody would like, I mean, everybody put something in a plate. You didn't ever see, in my church I grew up in, it didn't matter if it was 25 cents. No one ever failed to worship the Lord in tithes and offerings. That's just part of what you had to do. But that's not what I'm talking about. Because we don't even take up an offering on Sunday morning. It's always funny when people say, hmm, you guys take up an offering? Yeah. Every Sunday. When you do it. Well, we don't actually just put it in a box out back. That's where we do it. I mean, we do it in Sunday school. We're not in Sunday school, so we just put it in the box in the back. So, look, I have no objections to saying, to, to giving being a form of worship. Because let me tell you, I believe that it is. I fully believe that giving can be a form of worship because there is a spiritual gift of giving. So it has to be a form of worship. But that's not what I want you to think about. But when we talk about, hey, I, I need to bring an offering. I, I need to bring something that I'm going to give God. Because when we come to worship, that's what we see in the form of the Old Testament. Anytime you came to worship, it didn't matter if it's a fellowship offering or the day of Yom Kippur. You are bringing a gift in which you're going to give to God. could be something as simple as like two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. It could be something as extravagant as a lamb or maybe a bull. You could bring, when you brought your first fruits, could be any kind of grain, could be wine, could be oil, could be any number of things. Whenever you came to worship, you realized you always brought that offering with you and you presented it to God. And God would accept that offering as part of your worship. Well, just because we don't do that now, and just because we've like substituted, hey, write a check and that becomes worship, that, that's not the same thing that we see going on. Again, we're looking for spiritual fulfillment in this. Not uh, bring a check or bring, you know, bring uh, somebody to show up next week with a gallon of wine. Wouldn't that be hilarious? Hey, Brian, I'm here to pay my tithes for the week. This is what I made. <laughs> no, if by gallon, you wouldn't show up with a gallon of wine. You know what we show up with? Gallon moonshine. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> unless you see Rick. Rick will gladly accept that uh, offer. And so... So what we, we're, we're looking for spiritual fulfillment. 
It's, never mind. See, I've gone in too deep. See, that's the problem sometimes. I'm in too deep, and I cannot dig out once I say it. So let's try to fix this spiritually, okay? I'll take care of your moonshine problem too, Pastor Rick. So when I bring this offering, because I've got to bring an offering, we're not looking for like something, you know, I'm going to give this because, you know, I've got to bring something to offer. This is what Romans 12, 1 says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercy of God, that you offer, what? Yourselves or your body, depending on your translation. Um, let's see, did I put the translation in my notes? Uh, my translation says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercy of God, to offer yourselves. I believe bodies at the NIV, kind of, yeah, that you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your true and proper worship. The old NIV, which I like the best, the 1984 version. See, I'm going to be like, you know how people you say, I'm a 1611 guy? I'm going to be like, in 20 years, I'm going to be like, I'm a 1984 NIV guy. <laughs> so, which is your true and proper worship, I believe, uh, the, in 1984 NIV said, which is your reason, what did it say? Spiritual act of worship, and I like that better. Not that I have a problem with this, but spiritual act of worship. Now, if you ever read the King James, which is what I know better, it says, which is your reasonable service. And so it conveys the idea that there's some obligation. I mean, just got to do this. I mean, i, I got to give God my body because, after all, that's what I'm expected to do. So that word, uh, the word that is translated as reasonable service or what the NIV calls your true and proper worship or your spiritual act of worship. So that word literally translates as, so the word translated reasonable is uh, logikos, and it comes from the Greek word logos, which is word, or in this case, it's like logic. So, so if you ever, like the word logic is based on the Greek word logos to some extent, it means logic or thinking. So what I've got here is an act or something going on that is logical or reasonable. And the other Greek word uh, means uh, service. So there is some logical, rational, or reasonable service that I've got to offer. Now here's the problem with that. The Greek word that is translated as service in the King James, which is not a problem for me, it is generally translated as one of the words for worship. Okay, so this is, could be translated as, in the King James, if we're reading that, could be translated as, which is your logical way of worship, or your reasonable worship, or, more appropriately, it is the best way to serve God when you worship, but that would stretch the verse out forever. So the idea is, when I'm, when I'm coming to worship, I'm going to bring something, and what I'm bringing is myself. I am Offering myself to God as a living sacrifice. Now, here's the thing that maybe muddies the waters a little bit. Our sacrifice, you understand that, has been paid by Jesus, right? So it's not like I'm saying, God, uh, here I am. Just take me and, you know, I'm offering myself in payment for my sin. No, that's crazy and ridiculous. Our sins have been paid for by Jesus. Well, then why in the world am I offering myself as a living sacrifice? Because in the system of worship, I've got an offering that I need to bring. And the offering that I need to bring is simply Jesus, Lord, here am I, use me. That's it. God, I'm here for you. And the reason we do that, so, so the reason we do that is because we understand what exactly God has done for us through Jesus Christ. That's why we bring an offering. That's why we say, God, I belong to you. And I belong to you alone because we know what God has done for us. I mean, the Bible says great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. That's from the Old Testament. That should mean more to us than it did to them thousands of years ago before the New Testament. Because you know why I say great is the Lord and greatly to be praised? I say that because when I was dead in trespasses and sin, God sent his son Jesus into the world to die specifically for me. And because of that, I owe God a debt that I could never pay off. I mean, if I preached for a hundred years, I could never pay off the debt. If I sang songs in worship for a hundred years, never pay off the debt. If I gave every penny that I ever earned, I could never pay off the debt that Jesus paid in my place. See, I owe a debt 
that I'm never going to pay off, but I don't have to because Jesus paid it for me. That's why God is great. That's why God is good. That's why we come to worship and we say, God, you're worthy of praise because you did, you did for us what we could never do for ourselves when we were separated by a dividing wall of sin, when we were like a sinful woman who had nothing to bring, when we were that person, you broke down the barriers so that we could get to where you are. And because of that, we are forever grateful for what you've done in our lives. See, worship doesn't really make sense to people who've never had this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, other, until you've experienced that, you're like, why well, you guys waste a perfectly good Sunday? I mean, today's a good Sunday morning to be out cutting firewood. You guys are wasting it in church. You're listening to some guy talk forever. You're singing songs that I don't know the words to. I don't get any of that. You don't get it. And you will never get it until you've had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when you've done that, you're like, I get it now. Jesus saved me when I was not worthy to be saved. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Bow your heads with me while Danny comes to the song of invitation.